so far we have conducted 44 uh, classes on the um, sacred teachings of Master Gamboba and uh, so all of you have been so enthusiastically um, studying with me which I rejoice and uh, so today will be the uh, con conclusion of that particular book. Um, the, so we have um, some leftover from last week's. There was a um, we covered half of last week's uh, ten spontaneous bliss, ten great, uh, ten, ten great bliss. Uh, the part of last week's subject was called uh, the ten spontaneous the ten spontaneous bliss red bliss or um, to be precise the name of the title is uh, the title of the um, last week's lesson is that the great bliss is uh, spontaneously formed the great bliss is spontaneously formed because because of this and this and that so uh, anyway we will um, be concluding the book and as we say in uh, uh, in Buddhist practice we always try to remind ourselves wherever there is a um, gathering there is always a separation so since we started the book there is an end to the book as well so what we have started a week a year ago now is coming into an end um, so this is a, also a rem reminder that uh, everything is impermanent of course intellectually we all know that but personally it's a whenever it happens to us personally it takes us um, by toll we are shaken by that mm, just a, wanted to remind you that this is a um, as we started we are ending so this will be the end of uh, today's teaching will be the uh, last teachings of uh, Master Gamboba's um, precious garment okay so let's continue from what's left uh, since last week okay um, so today's teaching starts from uh, point number six um, so the great bliss is spontaneously formed because um, so great bliss as I mentioned last week is a reference to the um, amount of bliss that is experienced or enjoyed um, by an enlightened person when they become Buddha and uh, that particular great joy uh, that, per that, that particular um, experience um, is enjoyed by the Buddhas and uh, the Buddhas uh, are, have the, the four kayas or the three kayas or the three bodies, enlightened bodies out of which uh, Dharmakaya is um, Dharmakaya is something that they realize, something that they actualize so actualization of Dharmakaya uh, makes it uh, possible for an uh, unenlightened a defiled person to become enlightened and uh, pure perfect Buddha um, the reason being um, the uh, the very uh, the Dharmakaya or the um, um, the Dharma body the Dharmakaya <clears throat> which is the the ultimate truth ultimate truth being uh, entities uh, devoid of being inherently existing so that suchness that truth the truth body as sometimes it's called the Dharmakaya is the truth body and the truth here refers to the fact that all things are empty of having inherent existence so that that uh, that emptiness that vacancy that voidness uh, is the very truth of all phenomena and so therefore realizing that understanding it realizing it 
and finally actualizing it uh, as the combination of Buddhahood. So therefore, the Dharmakaya or the truth body is inseparable from the primordial wisdom uh, in the sense that, uh, of course, there is a preceptor and there is, um, one might say there's the object and there is the um, subject. The wisdom is the one that realizes Dhammakaya and Dhammakaya is the object to be realized. So therefore, there is an uh, object and subject in a sense. Uh, one might say the Dhammakaya is the object and uh, the um, the primordial wisdom is the subject. So one is the perceiver and the one the other is the one to be perceived. <clears throat> Uh, but 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 such a functionality, such a functionality, such a function, uh, such functionality of perceiving, perception, to be perceived, all these are possible only through the uh, voidness, through the uh, emptiness, only through the emptiness of having inher inherent existence. If things do have an inherent nature, if things are existing if things are existing uh, inherently if things are rooted in absolutism then things cannot be changed transformed transferred um, moved or uh, at all and uh, whatever they are whatever things are they, it will be their very nature if somebody is defiled if the mind is defiled then it would be the very nature of the mind because it is inherently existing def um, defilements. If a defilement, if the mind is defiled inherently, then the defilement would be the very nature of the mind and uh, um, removing the defilements will remove the mind as well. And so therefore there will be no stream of mind to reach Buddhahood. So if you remove the negative mind, the mind itself will be removed if uh, the mind, the primordial wisdom, all of that is rooted in absolutism. Since they are, they meaning uh, the, the primordial wisdom as well as the uh, dharmakaya, the wisdom body, uh, sorry, the truth body, are both rooted in the absence of absolutism. Therefore, uh, they are inseparable uh, one might also say that they are inseparable because they are self uh, they are reliant not exactly self-reliant but they are mutually reliant uh, the the wisdom body has to be recognized has to be actualized or recognized by uh, the primordial wisdom the truth body sorry the truth body has to be actualized by the wisdom body to come into existence and uh, without the truth body the wisdom primordial wisdom cannot be realized because there is no subject for it to uh, perceive upon but therefore the mutual uh, the mutual reliance of the two makes them inseparable in a way so therefore uh, our um, next line uh, the line that we are covering uh, is uh, the Dhammakaya which is inseparable from both primordial wisdom and uh, the sphere or the ultimate truth. Thus the great bliss is spontaneously formed. You are muted, Rumbhichita. Rimichi, we cannot hear you, Rimichi. Ah, oh, okay. So, um, okay. So this is the uh, um, the Dharmakaya, the truth body, and as we covered last week, body does not necessarily mean the physical aggregate. Uh, rather, it is more of a the whole composition. So when we say, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in a simple language, we say a, a body of books. It does not necessarily mean uh, a body does not necessarily mean a human physical aggregate of a human being. 
Um, so it can be the qualities of that person as well. So uh, the truth body is the uh, composition of the the whole truth of an enlightened being. And uh, and uh, since that the truth which the Buddha realizes and the, the realization of the truth itself are both inseparable in the sense that they are um, mutually reliant upon each other as well as the fact that uh, uh, they are both in the uh, very in, in the same nature of uh, uh, being depleted of uh, having an inherent existence or inherent nature. Um, therefore, they are um, inseparable or indivisible. Maybe that is the proper word. Indivisible. One cannot uh, indivisible in the sense that uh, none of them are outside. Uh, of this sphere of inherent existence, uh, the sphere of none of them are outside of the sphere of emptiness of being inherently existing. Um, so therefore, they are both uh, inseparable as well as inseparable because they are mutually reliant and indivisible because they are both rooted in the uh, same nature of absence of inherent existence. Um, that being said, uh, we now go to uh, the next, which is the enjoyment body. Uh, so normally when we say the three bodies, we have the enjoyment body, um, the emanation body, and the truth body. So um, here the enjoyment body is uh, compared uh, to the compassion. So the line goes like this, the self-originating compa uh, compassion, enjoyment body, is devoid of any elaborations of transformation of death and birth. Um, thus, the great bliss is spontaneously formed. So what it tells us here is that uh, mm, the first word, uh, the self-originating compassion. Um, of course, there are, that there are two reasons for that. One is that compassion is something that one doesn't need to be taught. Even though lots of uh, Dharma books talk about compassion, Compassion itself, in its more in, in, in its most basic form, uh, compassion is something that has that does not need to be taught. What is being taught in the books are something called the great compassion. Uh, compassion in general, we have towards uh, we have uh, we 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 have uh, it within uh, within us. Compassion in general, uh, through the time of conception. Um, we have compassion towards our parents, uh, people we love, people we care for. We always have compassion towards them because we cannot bear to see we cannot bear to see them in suffering. That is compassion, the unbearability of seeing someone, uh, seeing someone uh, screaming in suffering. That is the definition of compassion, the, unbear the unbearableness, the unbearability of seeing someone suffering. And that uh, the unbearableness comes only when you really care for that person, love that person. And so therefore, <clears throat> uh, the compassion in general is uh, innate. It's natural, but um, of course, in the Dharma books, we always talk about compassion. But this is something. This is a reference to what we call Ninji Chimbo, which is the great compassion, and that is the great compassion equalizes everyone, uh, the people you love as well as the people you do not love. Uh, in other words, people that are close to you as well as people that are uh, distanced from you, and uh, so you equalize all of them and make them all the people that you like and so therefore since all since everyone becomes the person that you like then you have you can generate compassion towards every one of them so in that sense compassion is self uh, self originated or it is automatic so therefore it's self originating um, so compassion this is one way of looking at it 
Another thing is uh, the great compassion, which has to be taught uh, for a beginner. Once you become a Buddha, the compassion—I uh, mean, not even Buddha, Buddha. But once once you become a Bodhisattva, uh, the great compassion comes naturally to you. Of course, after lo lots of training, uh, so then it becomes your nature, and it will be self-generating. You will not need to push hard to generate compassion afterwards. So therefore, uh, someone after someone has reached the stage of a Bodhisattva. Um, especially an Arya Bodhisattva, uh, sublime Bodhisattva, one would non, no longer need to push hard to generate Bodhicitta. So therefore, uh, Bodhicitta and compassion, the great compassion. <clears throat> so in that sense, the great compassion is self-generating or self-originating. Um, so anyway, um, maybe I'm going a little bit too technical here. So the enjoyment body of the great compassion of the Buddhas is devoid of any uh, elaborations of death and birth. Of course, there is death and there is birth in general, uh, but the enjoyment body is devoid of uh, not only uh, transformation of death and birth, but it's also, since it is devoid of any transformation of death and birth, there will be <clears throat> There are no elaborations at all. So, as we remember from last week's teaching, uh, elaboration here refers to some, adding something extra, something that is not there, but you are adding it just to make you feel good or whatever. So that extra things comes in the form of inherent existence, inherent nature. So when it's free from the elaborations, it is free from inherent existence. Uh, the truth, in reality, there is no elaboration. It is not. There is nothing out there that that there is nothing out there that does exist inherently. But our mind makes up things to perceive things in such a way that they do appear uh, inherently. But that elaboration is uh, cut off um, um, by the. Uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the compassion, uh, the great compassion of the uh, enjoyment body of the enlightened beings. So that is the uh, enjoyment body, and uh, next is the um, emanation body. So if you remember, like a few weeks, a few maybe a few months back. Uh, Somebody asked about the emanation body and the enjoyment body on all that questions. So uh, enjoyment bodies, the enjoyment when the when the Buddha comes in the enjoyment body in the in the form of an enjoyment body, uh, the uh, ordinary people cannot see them. Uh, only the individuals of the bodies above Arya Bodhisattvas, only individuals above the Arya Bodhisattva, the Noble Bodhisattvas can see them. Even ordinary Bodhisattvas cannot see them. Um, uh, so, um, in other words, the enjoyment body can be enjoyed only by um, the a select few of the very <clears throat> high caliber, if you like, students. Uh, so, um, so what we are able to see uh, is the uh, the uh, emanation body, Tulku. And uh, so Buddha Shakyamuni who came to this world and uh, all the other Buddhas that came to this world and, that's, and uh, uh, that, that, that human beings are able to receive teachings and so on and so forth were all, um, they, all they all came in the emanation body. So they emanate, um, they emanate or they manifest in a form that is uh, perceivable for ordinary human beings uh, through all the defilements that they have. Uh, if they come in the purest of the pure, pu purest of the purest form, it cannot be seen by human beings. Uh, you know, when it, uh, even in today's science, when the energy is it's in the purest form, it cannot be seen by naked human eyes. Uh, it can only be uh, calculated or it can only be um, 
it cannot be seen by naked human eyes. Similarly, when the Buddha comes in the purest form, it cannot be seen by ordinary human beings. And uh, for us, for ordinary human beings to see them, uh, to perceive them, the Buddha also has to emanate, to manifest a form that has some defilements, some form of defilements. Uh, Buddha has to emanate in a form that is uh, visible to us. They cannot come, they cannot appear in the purest form uh, because that will be invisible to our eyes. Uh, <clears throat> so therefore, um, Buddha manifests or comes or appears in the emanation body uh, for our benefit, for our sake. Um, so, um, in that sense, so now the emanation body is okay so now the lesson number eight the uh, emanation body the self-arising compassion of the emanation body is devo devoid of dualistic formations thus the great bliss is spontaneously formed um, so so once again um, the dualistic formation the dualism of uh, uh, a subject and object uh, so there are many forms of there are many types of dualism uh, in Buddhism, when we talk about dualism, it's not just one form of dualism. That is the um, the perception and the per the perceiver and the perceived, um, the person and thought, uh, long uh, the distance, um, uh, um, long and short. So there are many forms of uh, dualism. Uh, here, the dualism that we are referring to is the uh, dualism of uh, subject and object and uh, in the manner of the subject and the object uh, form, forming the subject and the object forming in in an inherent nature or in other words the subject and the object being uh, rooted in absolutism if the subject and object are rooted in absolutism then the subject cannot be moved, so, so to speak, by uh, the uh, the object, the object of meditation, uh, if you like, cannot be moved, cannot be transformed, cannot be uh, transferred by the subject, the mind, and so therefore the mind has no control over the um, subject. Uh, the, sorry, the mind, which is the subject, would have no uh, control over the object, um, because the, the object is high, rooted in absolutism. It is inherently uh, absolute. Since it is absolute, it is also obsolete in the sense that it is not uh, usable. It is not utilizable. Um, and so if both the subject and the object are rooted in absolutism, they are both become obsolete in the sense that they cannot be they cannot have any more use usage than that then that it is also already being used that means they are not infinite that they are not uh, they cannot be developed infinitely that they cannot be developed uh, at all because they are absolute mm, so therefore the subject and object or the perceiver and the the perceived the mind and the um, the object of the um, mental perceptions are both free, are devoid of any dualistic formation. Inherently exist, in, inherently rooted dualis, dualism. Since it's free of inherently rooted dualism, or in other words, absolutism, therefore they are mandible they are malleable and so therefore they can be transformed, 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 transferred, uh, developed and so on and so forth. So the self-arising compassion of emanation body is devoid of dualistic formations so therefore it is uh, the, so therefore the great bliss of an enlightened Buddha, an enlightened person is spontaneously formed. <clears throat> Um, so number nine is the 
the core teaching, the core point of the number nine is that in Buddhist, uh, in, in, in the teachings of the Buddha Dharma, in Buddha's teachings, the, the Buddha Dharma, uh, there is no sign, um, there is no sign of uh, um, um, the, the self teaching any teachings on the self, or in other words, the, the Buddha's teaching emphasizes on the selflessness. Uh, sometimes we call it um, um, the um, self-grasping attitude, uh, self-apprehension. So, it, um, and sometimes we call it um, the grasping of the soul. So, in so there are many different translations. So it's difficult to pinpoint at one thing. Uh, the word used in Sanskrit is atma, and uh, atma in the Buddhism we use it term called atma, um, anatma. So atma literally means soul uh, and anatma means soulless. So in Buddhism we accept the absence of a soul. <clears throat> so what we are doing here is uh, the, 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 um, the person, if we pinpoint as to what um, constitutes a person, um, all the teachings that predate Buddha Dharma, uh, Buddha's Buddha, uh, all the teachings, all the Dharma, uh, so he, when we say Dharma, it doesn't necessarily mean Buddhism, because uh, Hindu, Hinduism also Dharma. So uh, dhar all the uh, uh, the teachings, the philosophies that originated in India, predating but uh, or originated in India, were called Dharma, and Dharma literally means uh, discipline. So Dharma is also a very ambiguous word. It can mean truth. It can mean discipline. It can mean um, um, apprehension, so on and so forth. Anyway, so the point being, in the Hindu Hindu Dharma, uh, they talk about the existence of a soul, a person is constituted, uh, at the very core of the person there is a soul and it is the soul that tr travels from this life to the next life and so on and so forth. Everything else is destroyed when you when you die, you burn the body and all the physical aggregates are um, destroyed. But the soul remains, the soul cannot be destroyed by fire and this and that and all that. Uh, so in Buddhism, we uh, uh, challenge that, and uh, if the soul, anyway, so that is a long story. It, it's, a, it's a long story in itself. So the point is, uh, we talk about something called selflessness. So the soul is the very core, the, the core value of the um, of a person, and so therefore believing in uh, recognizing the soul is a key uh, part of a Hindu practitioner in Hindu real in, in Hindu Dharma. Um, they believe in finding out the core of the uh, person, which is a soul. And once you find your soul, then you find you have found uh, your ultimate sort of goal. And so at the um, so in, in Hinduism also there are many different philosophies. So one cannot say one 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 statement does not cover all of them, but generally realizing the self, as realizing the self or realizing the soul is a very big part of it. Uh, but in Buddhism uh, we challenge all of that, and so we, as long as you are grasping or apprehending, as long as you are holding on to a self, then you are still being stuck. In samsara, you will be still be stuck in samsara. That is the Buddhist uh, philosophy. That is the Buddhist belief. But uh, that's what the Buddha taught us. And uh, um, as long as so, therefore, Buddha's teachings are devoid of any form or any sign of self self grasping attitude or um, search for the self. Uh, so therefore. The Dharma does lead us to Nirvana. Buddha's teaching, the Dharma does lead us to Nirvana because 
it is devoid of any signs of self-grasping attitude or any signs of a teaching on atma realizing the self realizing the soul mm. Mm, there was a uh, share a story uh, one long time back like maybe 30 40 years ago his holiness uh, this is a story his holiness told us um, so like maybe 30 I think 40 years over 40 years ago uh, 40 50 maybe so in it's, it's in the 1980s I think so a long time ago um, um, the 1970s I think yeah so a long time ago there was a uh, there was an Indian um, Indians in uh, predominantly of course uh, Hindus right so there was a Indian uh, Indian I think he was quite a bit of a scholar a thinker and then he came to know of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and he followed His Holiness, and uh, he, he loved the teachings, and he started to become a, a Buddhist. Uh, previously, he was a Hindu. And then uh, in Hinduism, of course, uh, the idea of Atma is uh, very important, crucial. And uh, so he has learned about the Hindu philosophy and uh, the Atma and all that. <clears throat> and then he came to His Holiness teaching, the, he started His Holiness taught about the uh, pre impermanence and uh, you know all these things which he accepts very gladfully everything and then his holiness because his holiness is such a great teacher his holiness also taught about the anatma or the selflessness that there is no soul and uh, initially he was it was the first time he heard that but because his holiness was such a great teacher he was able to kind of comprehend it and then he went home and meditated on that. I think he's a great, good, very good practitioner because he put into practice whatever his holiness, uh, whatever his teacher taught him. So he put that into practice. He started doing the practice, and then maybe one or two days later, I don't know exactly. Like um, after a few days, he he has like a panic attack. His whole body starts sh uh, shivering, shaking, and uh, he, he he got scared he got panic attack because he now thinks that he is no longer there because when we were taught about the uh, the absence of a soul <clears throat> since the as, as a previously Hindu practitioner he has been taught he has been trained and taught in the ways of uh, the Atma uh, so well that he the the self is identified with the soul the person is identified with the soul uh, separation of the soul and the person is impossible for him so when the self is uh, removed when you talk when you think of the selflessness when you think of the uh, absence of the self or absence of the soul uh, the person himself starts to dissolve and so while meditating on selflessness, he is feeling um, that he himself is being dissolved, that he himself is being disappeared, dissolved into emptiness or dissolved into voidness. And so he got he, he got um, he got scared. He has a panic attack, and then he came to his holiness again and saying, you know, this is so difficult for me. Um, I cannot do it anymore. The meditation on anatma, meditation on selflessness. Uh, do you have any other idea? Then do you have any tips to like remove my fear, or should I stop this and that kind of thing? And then his holiness taught him about what we call the uh, so teachings on emptiness, teachings on selflessness. All these things we call the wisdom aspect. Uh, so this so going too far on the wisdom aspect uh, proved a bit critical for him because he was a great thinker I think so therefore you know he went a bit too far uh, but people like us uh, who couldn't think very well uh, when we were taught about emptiness when we were taught about uh, in uh, selflessness we don't feel anything because our mind is not that sharp to touch the point so therefore when we were taught about uh, emptiness and this kind of thing we don't have uh, we don't feel anything because oh yeah emptiness okay it's understandable this and that it feels so 
um, it's easy. It's easy for us to accept this because we are not able to think as profoundly, as thoroughly, as we should. If you do think so, since we are uh, so strongly uh, embedded, we are so strongly embedded in uh, the experiences of inherent existence, in the experiences of uh, a self. Um, um, an independently existing self for so long that if that self, if that soul is removed, then we feel as we very, uh, we are being removed. We are no longer in, in existence. We are blown away into oblivion. That is what we will, that, 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 that is what we should be feeling, but we are not. Anyway, so His Holiness uh, then gave him advices on the, the method aspect, you know, the wisdom aspect and the method aspect. So uh, he taught about the compassion, taught about um, uh, the, you know, the great bliss, uh, bodhicitta and this and that. And gradually he was able to come back after, you know. Um, and uh, if you remember, uh, I told you many, 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 many months ago, <laughs> There was uh, the story of the, that's not the story, but like the, uh, you know, the example, now the analogy of uh, a horse rider. If you don't know horse riding at all, there is nothing to be scared of because you don't know what it feels to ride on a horse. Uh, but if you know how to ride a horse very well, then there's nothing to be scared of because you know it very well. You know how to handle your horse. Um, so if you have rode on a horse a few times but has have not mastered how to ride a horse properly then every time you are riding the horse you'll be uh, scared because you are always afraid that you will fall down let's you you can use the uh, same example with swimming if you have not yeah you know, if you have not swim swam ever you don't think swimming is dangerous or fearful or anything if you know very well how to swim you will not be scared. But if you have dumped in the swimming pool several times, but you have uh, you don't know how to swim well enough, then every time your feet touch water, you will be scared. One of our friends, uh, he's a uh, from from the monastery. He doesn't know how to swim, uh, but we off because it's very hot here in uh, in, in in the Sierra. So sometimes we go to like the, um, the poolside and. Uh, you know, to water water spots. So, but he doesn't know how to swim, right? But he would always immerse his feet in the water and stay like that. So every time we try to call him for a swim, he would say, "Oh, my stomach! I have stomach! Uh, I have stomach problems. My st I have stomach upset, so I don't want to be in the water for too long. So I cannot. I, I don't want to swim." But the reality is that he doesn't know how to swim, and he's really scared of swimming. <laughs> So let's just let me just finish the last uh, line. So the <clears throat> lesson, uh, the number point number ten is that uh, the infinitely compassionate activities of an enlightened being are devoid of distinction of time, um, time and, and distance. And so therefore, the great bliss is uh, spontaneously formed. So what it basically means here is that uh, the compassion. Uh, not just the compassion, which is the uh, the seed, but the uh, activities that is generated by the compassion. So you know, there, normally we talk about the two types of two types of bodhicitta, right? Um, the uh, engaging bodhicitta and wishful bodhicitta. So wishful bodhicitta is that oh, I wish I can do something for that, and then engaging bodhicitta is actually doing it. Uh, both are important. If you do not have a wishful bodhicitta, you will not ever, you, you know, there are many things that we can, uh, um, there are many problems that we can solve in this world, this life, and then there are many pe problems that is beyond um, our, uh, beyond us, um, at least at this very moment. So therefore, mm, both wishful bodhicitta as well as engaging bodhicitta are important. Similarly, uh, compassion in general is the seed, is the wish to uh, uh, alleviate 
someone's suffering uh, but that wish that thought that motivation has to be uh, translated into action uh, without which uh, motivation alone compassion alone won't be that helpful um, so compassion the seed the thought the seed of thought is uh, um, equally important as the action that has to be followed through um, so therefore uh, the action are the action is regarded as the enlightened activities of the Buddha in Tibetan we called Tile or so uh, so the activities of the Buddha, the enlightened activities of the Buddha are the are the physical translation of what has been uh, thought, what has been uh, conceived by the Buddhas in their uh, compassionate mind. Mm. So therefore, uh, the compassionate activities, the enlightened activities of the Buddhas are devoid of any distinction between caste, creed, rich, poor, um, famous, not famous. So there is no distinction. There is no, um, every, all, everyone is equal in that sense. So therefore, uh, the Buddha looks upon everyone uh, with equal eyes. Mm. Um, so therefore, if, if Buddha sees everyone differently, then of course people uh, who have name, who have uh, money will become will 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 get liberation faster, and those who have not will take a long time to be liberated. But since it is not about whether you have a name, fame, <clears throat> wealth, and so on and so forth, but about whether you have um, your faith, devotion, and uh, faith in the Dharma, faith in the Buddha, and devotion into the practice of what the Buddha preached uh, which is that is the most important thing uh, so therefore um, the uh, Buddha's activities Buddha's blessings does not distinguish someone from their wealth color uh, uh, and name and so on and so forth in Tibetan there's a saying which means in my in my fellowship in, in in Buddha's fellowship or in in Buddhism to be precise in in simple in in plain simple English in my in in, in Buddhism so what the Buddha said was in my fellowship <clears throat> uh, race and creed are not crucial but uh, practice is so practicing what the Buddha preached what the Buddha taught what the doctrine taught uh, is crucial uh, whether which race you come from which uh, what kind of social status you have is not important and that what that's why Buddha become a revolutionary in his time and uh, Buddhism is different from Hinduism in the sense that the caste system is absolutely um, disregarded. Um, <clears throat> uh, in Hindu system, in, in Hinduism, the caste system is a very big uh, thing. But of course, it, it has its own pros and cons. Um, but in Buddhism, it's totally disregarded. So when you become a monk, uh, normally a person from the lower caste, as uh, so someone, <clears throat> someone who is a cobbler, someone who makes shoes, is regarded as a very low caste. So if, if even if someone is from the shoemaker's family, uh, if when that person becomes a monk, when that person is into the fellowship of the Buddha, when they, <clears throat> <clears throat> then the kings has to bow down to them, and the king has to pay homage to the monk. <clears throat> and this particular practice is very very intactly uh, kept in some of the Theravada traditions such as Sri Lanka but in most part of the world I think uh, even in like so-called Mahayana and you know 
the great vehicle, the, the Vajrayana, this and that. Most of the, um, most other traditions, this system, this tradition no longer exists. But in Theravadan tradition, such as um, Sri Lanka, as well as um, Thailand, these traditions still is preserved. Anyway, so that is the last of the teachings. Um, okay. And then if you have questions, you can ask after this. Please. Um, we have a couple of questions. I'll read the questions as it's written. Um, prostrate to Rinpochela. Will you please uh, teach us the pit on how we can control um, less dualistic of subject and object in order to avoid of less elaboration? Um, thank you, Rinpochela. <clears throat> Oh yeah. Um, so the uh, dualistic apprehension or uh, being uh, tied to the dualistic ideas of um, the subject and object. Of course, in reality, there is a subject and there is an object. But to be, uh, when we say the dualistic uh, existence of an, the dualistic nature of an um, object and subject and object, we are referring to the fact. We are referring to the um, term the subject and object existing in its own reality, uh, totally rooted in as its own absolutism. Uh, the subject is no longer no truer. The subject is no truer. Uh, the the object is no truer than the subject that it is. Um, perceiving <clears throat> and uh, the subject is also um, the result of the object that it is con uh, it, it is con conceiving or perceiving um, one example uh, is that uh, okay l let me tell you this way mm, whatever you can hear or, or, or whatever you are hearing right now is because you let it pass through your ears, your mind, and so on and so forth. Uh, let it, you let it pass through your gates of um, perception, the doors of perception, be it your ears, be it your eyes, be it your mind, so on and so forth. When you let it pass through, you can think of it, you can hear it, and on and so on and so forth. So if you stop thinking, if you uh, stop any of these event, external events happening to pass through your um, sense organs or the uh, the, um, the preceptors, the doors to which they are um, um, susceptible, then you will not be able to hear them, you will not be able to think of them. Um, to make it make things more clear, you can only think of the things you think, and you think only the things that you can think of. The things that you cannot think of, you will never think of them. This proves that whatever you are thinking is enabled. Whatever you are uh, able to think, whatever whatever you are capable, whatever you are thinking is created by your ability to think. So therefore, you can, even though the world exists, um, there, there are so many things happening in the world, only a small portion of that uh, becomes the subject of your mind, the object of your mind, or the subject of your mind, of your knowledge, because this is the amount of knowledge that your brain or your mind can handle. So when I, when you have an understanding of what I am say, saying, when you hear me, you hear me through what your understanding, your abilities enable you to think of. So therefore, it is limited to 
what you hear from me is not subject to what I'm speaking, but to what you are uh, capable of hearing. Uh, that's why we always have lots of misunderstanding in general in life. Uh, we, you know, uh, things are misconstrued, things are misunderstood, and so on and so forth, because we understand everything from our own point of view through the capabilities that we possess. And so, therefore, when we hear something, we hear uh, the words differently, the meanings different, and so on and so forth. And uh, so, the point here is that the the, uh, the the reason is things are not absolutely true externally as it is internally, and the thing and that goes vice versa. <clears throat> the mind is also a result of the object that it is perceiving. If there is no object to perceive for the mind then the mind cannot exist because the mind also needs something to chew on. Uh, the mind needs an object um, to focus. If there is no object at all, then the mind will also cease to exist. But at the same time, the object that is, uh, uh, the, the object that is externally out there also needs to be val uh, validated by the mind without the mind, the, without the support of the mind, the object will also cease to exist. If, if no mind, if no uh, mental perceptor perceives something to be what it is, then it, that, that object cease to be what it is. For example, this is a mug. Because I, I'm, I think this is a mug, you think this is a mug, lots of people in the world think this is a mug. Let's say nobody in the world, nobody, not, not just in this world, but no, nowhere, nobody think, thinks of this as a mug. No Buddhas, no Bodhisattvas, no gods, no human beings, nobody. Everyone sees to see, everyone stops seeing this as a mug. Then this will, this object will cease, this object will stop being a mug, for sure. This object will maybe become something else, this object will be something will be identified by some other name or some other thing, but this object will no longer be a mug. So the thing I'm trying to emphasize here is that uh, object and subject uh, exist only through uh, interdependency. And so therefore, since they have this mutual uh, reliance, uh, they are not rooted in absolutism of their own. And so therefore, dualistic, uh, they are not dualistically existing. Uh, so dualistic understanding is that things do exist on its own, that the subject has a very own, very truth of its own, and the object has a very truth of its own. But the reality is that sub both subject and object are mutually reliant, can, be, can only be mutually validated. Without one, the other ceases to exist. It's like left and right. Subject and, subject and object are like left and right. Without left, there is no right. Without right, there is no left. Um, so there is no absolute right and there is no absolute left. What is the most right thing in the world? What is the most left thing in the world? There is no such thing. The left is left because of the right and the right is right because of the left. So similarly, the subject is there because of the object, and the object is there sub because of the subject. So <clears throat> the existence of both subject and object are um, um, never absolute, are always uh, changing, are always um, uh, are always changing, and are uh, and never um, absolutely reliable in a sense. So that by thinking on by 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 thinking on these ter terms, one will be able to uh, distance distance oneself from the uh, let's say attachment or being close towards dualistic uh, mindset. Yeah. Okay. Next question. <clears throat> Uh, yeah. Rinpochella, please explain more about the absence of the soul or anatma, soullessness. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. If so, uh, when we say the Buddha, 
who do we refer to? Thank you, Bumichi. Mm, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it's a quite popular question in the. Uh, it's an argument <clears throat> made with when when the Buddhist uh, teachers, Buddhist masters, when they debated with the Hindu masters back in the day, they have this uh, issue. Um, so if the Buddha, uh, yeah, if there's no soul, then who is the who who, who becomes a Buddha? Uh, <clears throat> that is a big question. Um, uh, for example, when uh, since, since uh, ever since we were born, we have many experiences. We become many things. We want to. <clears throat> at a, there was there was a time when we were just a uh, we were a toddler. We cannot walk. At that time, there are different things that we want. And then we become a child. We want different things. We want to become different things. We want to be different things. We want different things, and <clears throat> and at that time uh, we can walk on two feet, uh, but we cannot run. But as as we grow a little bit older, we, be, we become our teenage years. We can run faster. Uh, our looks are different. Our thoughts are also different. Again, we have different needs, different wants, a different interest, and so on and so forth. Then as we come into like maturity, into adulthood. Uh, our appearances also changes again, uh, become losing hair, mm, becoming getting big stomach, and uh, you know getting more wrinkles and so on and so forth. Appearance also change. Again, the mind also changes. Uh, what we need, what we wanted as kids, we no longer wanted them when we were uh, when we, we become adults. We want different things. Uh, we had it, we have different interests and so on and so forth. So all in that time. The I remained. We keep saying, for example, I me mean, Tongo Rinpoche. So, at a, as, a, as, a, as a small kid, I am Tongo Rinpoche. I have different needs, different ones. As an adult, different needs, different ones. So on and so forth. The needs and wants and shapes and appearances, everything changes. But the person remains, so to speak. Um, so, if there is no soul, then where is that person? Who is the person? That question arises. Um, so the Buddhist answer, uh, is, the, the answer we give is that the um, the stream of consciousness remains, even though the consciousness is constantly changing, but the stream is always there. The uh, the continuum of our consciousness is there. Our body is no longer there. The body that we have when we were kids is no longer there. If you look at your own picture, if you take a selfie. Look at your own picture, and if uh, if you take a selfie and look at your picture right now, and uh, if you compare that with the picture that maybe it was taken 20, 30, 40 years ago, it's completely different. You are no longer that person at all. Um, maybe someone who knows you can re re say, "Oh, that is you," recognize you, but somebody who has not will not be able to identify you with the person 30, 40 years ago. And the same goes with your mindset and everything. Everything changes. But what remains is the continuum of the mind. Uh, the continuum, the continuation of that body is still there. Even the body has changed tremendously, but the continuum, continuation is there. From yesterday to today, the body has changed. Yesterday you are well. Today you are stomach upset. Uh, today you are um, stomach. Do you have stomach upset? Tomorrow you be, you get better. So the body is changing constantly. This morning you are hungry. After breakfast you are no longer hungry. Constantly changing, but the continuum of the body is there. The continuation of the body. So there is a some truth in in, in you know what we say in uh, sometimes we say in, in English the change is the only constant. Uh, I don't know who actually said that, but there's a saying in English change is the only constant thing in the universe. Um, so the the change or or the continuation or the the um, um, the stream of continuation. Of what has been, always is there. So what becomes the Buddha is the stream of your consciousness. Your consciousness also, your consciousness is also changing tremendously every moment. Every time you have a negative thought, that uh, even though the consciousness does not become a negative consciousness, it aligns with the negative thought. When you have a positive thought, the consciousness aligns with the positive thought, and so on and so forth. The conscious, the the shapes, the the curves of the consciousness is always changing, um, but the continuation, the co continuum of the 
uh, sorry, consciousness remains and this is what goes to Buddhahood. Okay, that's it. I think. Any more? No more questions today, Mbichila. That's all for today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Um, um,